I find the initiative that the organizing committee has taken in producing uh, this convention to be a glimmer of light in a dark sky, a dark sky that is uh, dominated by a, the most transparent instance of genocide in human history where because of the capacity of uh, worldwide media to show the daily unfolding of this terrible criminal action in Gaza and its related effects on the, uh, in the West Bank as well, the peoples of the world are exposed as never before to the concrete reality of genocide. It has always been in the past something relatively abstract from our consciousness. Here in Gaza, it is not only a visible reality for the peoples of the world and the governments, the leaders and those in international institutions. It is also something that is reinforced by the explicit endorsement of such an approach to conflict as uh, has been embarked upon uh, by the leadership of Israel. Uh, never before has such a candid admission that one is striking against uh, the, the people as a whole, cutting off their food and fuel and electricity, bombing their hospitals and places of shelter, targeting places where children and women gather. So it is a horror story that makes this kind of initiative against militarism as epitomized by what is happening in Gaza, such a dominant uh, preoccupation of anyone with a global conscience to motivate them uh, to feel that they must act responsibly in light of such developments. Let me mention briefly my experience uh, with uh, militarism and war making, uh, having taught as was said at Princeton University uh, for 40 years, I was surrounded by some of the uh, world's leading scientists, including uh, Robert Oppenheimer and Freeman Dyson and others of uh, global stature. And what intrigued me was the degree to which these uh, outstanding scientists were enticed by the uh, opportunity to have an impact on government policy and to feed the militarist appetites of uh, the private sector, which uh, has thrived through the years on the exaggeration of security threats and the projection of American power worldwide. And this kind of unhealthy connection between uh, scientists and government policy, which is probably more extreme 
in both its character and effects in the United States than elsewhere. Uh, the degree to which uh, the U.S. is the greatest, has the largest military budget, and also is by far the largest uh, arms sales person, the largest uh, purveyor of the merchants of death, in effect. Uh, the other ex reinforcing experience I had was to uh, visit the strategic centers of global policy, global security policy in the United States, and uh, take notice of two kinds of personalities that one encountered there, uh, which were, they, these were venues dominated by scientists. One was a uh, feeling that by contributing to the military development of weaponry and doctrine and so on, scientists were somehow doing something in the quote-unquote real world, and that this was a, a source of almost a kind of uh, careerist uh, excitement for them. And the other kind of uh, scientific personality were people who didn't know a great deal about politics, but were uh, in, uh, indoctrinated into the prevailing ideology of the time and were uh, Cold War activists uh, in, a, in a very superficial, but let, led them to believe that their work as uh, helping with the development of weapons and the worst kind of weapons uh, was something that was positive, that it contributed to uh, a better world. In other words, ideology underpinned this enthusiasm for connection with the militarism that was broadly present in the society and very, very salient, uh, at least in the United States, throughout uh, the entirety of uh, the Cold War. And actually, after the Cold War, because it saw the opportunity with the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union to become the unipolar dominant presence in the world and didn't have the imagination to choose anything other than its military dominance as the path to this kind of uh, role in international political life. And this continues to be the case. And I focus on the United States partly because I know it best, but also because I think it represents, uh, it, it's in, a, in its own way, it's a powerful metaphor for the distortions that arise from this marriage of militarism and knowledge as filtered through uh, the brilliance of the world's uh, finest scientists. Uh, this this uh, kind of initiative uh, that you all are part of is a re an overdue reaction and perhaps the extremity of what's happening in Gaza made many of us act in ways that we were not uh, motivated to act before, that it, that it overcame uh, a human tendency toward complacency and a feeling of helplessness about 
these larger issues. But I think that one of the uh, revelations of this uh, outbreak of genocide in Gaza is the helplessness of the formal structures of war prevention and the protection of peoples against abusive behavior. The, the UN, which was uh, created as a war prevention uh, institution after World War II, has, was in a sense designed to fail because it gave the five most powerful countries in the world the uh, authority to block any kind of effective response uh, that might uh, oppose or uh, neutralize uh, militarism and aggressive and criminal criminal uh, undertakings in the course of war. It, what, it, this awakening, which I think is happening in many domains, not just among scientists, I'm part of a parallel initiative of so-called global intellectuals that is similarly awakening to the fact that if the peoples of the world do not take responsibility, uh, nothing effective will be done to curtail the menace of militarism and war. And, and so this is very important. There's one other general factor that hasn't often been taken into account, that in the, despite this surge of militarism uh, in the post-Cold War and uh, present world, militarism hasn't produced political results. It's actually proved to be dysfunctional in a series of symbolic activities that sought to bring to bear military superiority as a way of uh, controlling the political outcome. And the assumption of those that make foreign policy for almost all leading governments is that uh, history, is, uh, history is constituted uh, by those that prevail in military conflicts. That, in other words, that war and militarism have historical agency. But recent international experience defies that understanding. And the U.S. Among, uh, especially should have learned this uh, by its experience in the Vietnam War. In, Viet in that war that lasted almost a decade, the U.S. had complete military dominance, yet lost the war. And one has to understand that the lessons of that de political defeat cannot be learned by these militarist uh, governing elites because there's too strong a vested interest in persisting with the belief that military agency is what controls political outcomes and shapes history. And if uh, Vietnam wasn't enough of a uh, a pedagogic experience, then the 20-year commitment to state building in Iraq and in uh, Afghanistan 
should have been a br breakthrough in some kind of political consciousness. But again, the energies of uh, the militarist powers within societies were too strong to uh, to to learn the lesson that in an a, a post-colonial period of uh, important uh, powers exhibited by persisting persistent national mobilization, that uh, military uh, superiority does not any longer work. You look at all the, not only the examples I've given, but uh, Libya, uh, Yemen, Syria, all of these uh, venues of military intervention produced devastation, to be sure, but they didn't satisfy the objectives of those who invested lives and trillions of dollars in controlling the political outcomes. And basically, that's a constructive reality. That, that, and it's not just the United States. All the colonial wars were won by the weaker side militarily. And that's an Im terribly important lesson. And why it can't be learned is because it would undercut the profitability of the arms industry and the power of the military within governmental bureaucracies. So there's, uh, so what was done after the Vietnam War was not a matter of controlling, uh, uh, controlling involvement or the preparation, but the development of new weapons and the employment of scientists in that process, the tr effort to control the media, the, uh, the slogan in the US was that the Vietnam War was lost not on the battlefield in Vietnam, but in the American living room. And the idea was that the media would be more uh, subjected to the discipline of a militarized political consciousness. Uh, let me bring these uh, remarks to an end by going back to the uh, Gaza realities for a moment and saying that the Israeli uh, practice there of genocide is in a sense a recognition of the futility of war as between two military capabilities. This is a war against people, and it's a war that can be won only by the elimination or the dispossession of people. It, it, in, in that sense, it is a correct, a perverse, and uh, uh, surrealistic uh, recognition of the futility of conventional war as a way of shaping politics. And, and it's a horrifying uh, reaction to that futility by resorting to uh, an explicit uh, avowal of genocide as the basis of uh, Israeli security and uh, territorial ambition, in a sense. So let me uh, end by saying I applaud the draft definition, draft declaration which I think is a very powerful document, and I hope 
that this initiative will lead to a worldwide uh, process of anti-militarism and anti-war sentiment. Thank you very much.